All right, I think we're live. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good morning also, I think, for a lot of people still. And welcome to today's webinar, in um, which we are going to touch upon the topic of inclusive talent pooling, how to build a diverse talent pool, making use of skill-based uh, skill based hiring. I think, Dominic, we... Uh, spoke a couple of minutes before we uh, hit the go live button uh, and uh, what we mentioned before we went live is this is definitely one of those buzzwords that everyone is speaking up is speaking about in talent acquisition but it's also hard to get started with this concept so hopefully today we can um, turn this into a very practical session so that if you leave today's webinar you also have some tangible uh, uh, ways to get started um, before moving into the webinar, a very practical note, then I'm going to introduce myself and then Dominic, I uh, would love to ask you to introduce yourself as well. Um, if you do have any questions for us during the webinar, uh, or if you would like to just add something to the discussion, there is a chat functionality in the lower right corner of your screen. Uh, you can also see a questions uh, tab next to that. So if there is something that you would like to add or like to ask uh, to Dominic or to me, uh, feel free to just put it in the chat and we will uh, make sure to touch upon it. Then before I am going to start my introduction, uh, one question that I would like to ask everyone in the audience today is to briefly mention in the chat what you hope to get out of today's webinar uh, so that we can hopefully uh, also touch upon those topics. Um, quick introduction of who I am. Uh, my name is Charlotte. I am one of the founders of Equalture. Uh, we are an HR tech company based in the Netherlands um, and we develop a game-based assessment platform. Uh, we do that to help organizations transition from a hiring process that is very much focused on your CV, what did you do before, and a bit of gut feeling that is uh, oftentimes still in the process, to how can we use games in order to get a very objective scientific first impression of someone that is much more based on your competencies and your talents and your behavior in organizations. So I think that ties in the... Uh, and very well with what we are going to discuss today. And uh, Dominique, I brought you to the webinar today. Thanks a lot for joining. Um, would you like to quickly introduce yourself for everyone who's listening? Certainly. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, hi, everyone. I am Dominic Joyce, Head of Talent Acquisition and LinkedIn Top Voice uh, most recently. I've been in the TA space now for probably about 11 years. I've worked across agency, MSP, RPO, um, most recently in-house, my remit is helping companies, you know, dissect process, procedures, operations to basically improve candidate attraction, employee retention, and look at how we do things differently, right? Trying to be the 1% out there around candidate attraction, retention, and engagement. And yeah, delighted to be here. Thank you for having me. Cool. Thanks, Dominic. Hey, we are going to um, talk about talent pooling uh, and how to build a, um, a diverse talent pool through skill-based hiring. Now, I think that the concept of talent pooling, how to build an inclusive talent pool, as well as skill-based hiring, it's, uh, it, it's words that are being used a lot in the TA space, but I think a lot of people have a lot of different definitions of those two topics. So maybe to start with the concept of talent pooling or inclusive talent pooling, could you uh, briefly explain what that exactly means or what your definition of that is? Sure. So to me, talent pooling is having people with talent pooling is putting people into a box, a system or a pool, as they call it, um, and leaving them there whenever you want to pull them out. But the problem you've got is that very few companies are organized in how they talent pool. So to me, when you receive a candidate, externally you then make sure of course that you set things like tags and markers to identify skills experience and remit that if they're not successful during this round of interviews you can literally go into your candidate pool do a search based on those keywords to find out where they still are if they are still in the pool and basically retrieve them um also that kind of works two problems as well for your current workforce so um in the past i've talent pool people both internally and that can also link to, of course, as we discussed earlier, uh, internal ability, because equally you have to understand your current workforce, what they've been doing, what their skills are, and where they fit into the wider network of the company as part of their growth pattern. So that's to me what talent pooling is. Very few people actually have, I guess, a, a, a decent, structured, and collaborative talent pool that kind of bolts onto their ATS or so as part of their ATS. No. 
Hey, so basically, if I would summarize, then um, what you just said is talent pooling is instead of mainly if, instead of maybe looking at a candidate or a team member in the perspective of one specific job, um, you look at an individual and see, hey, based on their skills, what are the types of jobs that someone could fit for in an organization? So, for example, p candidates that are being rejected, is there another position in the company that we could introduce them to or an internal team member? who wants to move to another position, can we find something else based on their skill sets? Is that a good summary of what you just said? Yeah, correct. People seem to want to hire people for the here and the now, right? Very few think about the long-term strategy. You look at that, a current open job vacancy and think yes or no. They don't think no, not right now, which again is where talent pooling comes in, right? You get some great candidates that perhaps aren't right for that role there and then. Does not mean they're not right for the company. But rather than just saying no, and then them being lost into the wilderness of the candidate graveyard, you're effectively basically picking them up, tagging them, giving them attention they deserve, and put them in a safe place where you might need them again. So it's basically strategizing for future hiring. No, no, I agree. Hey, and uh, before we dive into um, part two, skills-based hiring, because I think that is how you, what you perceive as the the a, a technique to uh, uh, to make sure you get talent pooling right. Uh, but before we dive into that, um, I think that the concept of talent pooling, if I look at myself, I think I'm now in the, in the talent acquisition space for six, seven years. It's definitely something that I didn't hear of a lot, let's say three, four, five years ago. And since a year, maybe two years, it's very, it's, it's really a buzzword in the market. Why do you think it has become so much more uh, relevant or urgent to TA professionals to look into the concept of talent pooling? I think it goes hand in hand with the global shortage of skills. I think people from, you know, like you mentioned there, five, six years ago, would have looked at a candidate and would have just said, you know, right, this is a no from us, and then move on to the ones that are successful, not looking at the long term investment. And uh, I don't want to deem candidates as like money, but candidates can be seen as money or investment. So by basically throwing that candidate away, you're throwing an investment away. What we're doing now is understanding that there is a current global skill shortage. How we then basically take the current talent that's not right now, but basically plunk them somewhere safe and invest in them for future. So I think the problem now is that companies are finding it hard to attract people. So they're looking inwards at Intel talent and the skills based hiring then, but also externally on that so that's the problem what i'm currently seeing right now is companies seem to not have a clear strategy as to how they attract people but equally as well they're passing up on all the past applications that they received um for context we had at travel x applications last year which is a lot of people now don't get that me wrong yeah. don't get me wrong some people would have been from you know the deepest parts of the, of the world like potentially Peru, where we've got no, you know, footprint there, or they could have been, you know, in somewhere like, you know, deepest, darkest um, Beirut, but not saying we can ever work with them, but, you know, some weren't obviously right locality wise, but do you know what skill set they were. And effectively, it's how you then basically take those people, you tag them, you see the actual, because everyone has value, right? They apply for that job, doesn't then mean essentially because it's a no to that job, it's a no to the company. It's for the here and the now, it's a no, but let's look holistically at the future, can they add value to the business? If so, wouldn't it be great to go into this database and be like, right, I know we're going to be hiring this role in the next two months. I know the skills to do that role are X, Y, and Z. Let me do a search on our talent pool. And you'd probably find that you'd have hundreds of people that come and match the results. You've basically then got additional free CV database that you haven't got to pay for to another company. And in there is every candidate you've engaged with or at least had contact with at some point in the last six to 12 months. Yeah. Yeah, it's insane, right? That organizations sometimes spend so much budget also on recruitment marketing, just getting as much applicants in as possible. And then if you look at, just like you mentioned, like 100 candidates applied for uh, role one, uh, in most organizations, we will never look at those 100 candidates again and see if they would fit in another position in the company. While we did spend quite a lot of money on getting them in the funnel in the first place. So um, I think that uh i fully agree with what you said i think that the shortage in the market definitely has created a lot of urgency around this topic for for people to be a little bit more creative in uh, how they look at their talent pool um 
but then obviously the, the the more complex question is how do you actually do that then because it's quite a complex task i think to uh to make that matchmaking between candidates and roles that's also where skill-based hiring uh, comes into play. Um, could you quickly explain uh, what skill-based hiring is for you? Sure. To me, it's peeling back the layers of what the job requirements are and finding out what you need to be successful, not just in the role today, but also as well the growth of the role and the person's career. So for context, we were doing ourselves our own internal skills-based hiring strategy at TravelX. We went to market internally and externally to our stakeholders who were impacted when you hire people into these roles. Here's what we've dug out from market research of 20 skills, a mixture of soft skills, a mixture of hard skills. Please mm -hmm. tell us your top three skills that you feel people need in this role to be successful. Now, the top 10 skills that we received, I think 80% of them were soft skills, things around communication, adaptability, which kind of goes to show you that if the company's got a progressive and dynamic learning operational model for inductions, actual support function to train these people. You often just need the right growth mindset and the right desire to want to do the job. In doing so, by the context, we used to kind of target for our bureaus. I think obviously in the Netherlands, travel is quite prominent in the Netherlands too as well. We try and target people in banks in travel because again, that's where you know our remit is. And my argument was, well, we have a really good model here to train people, right? We just need them to kind of be open to learning and as a growth mindset to develop new skills. So we can hire fishermen, we can hire bakers, we can hire people that work in the armed forces, care and assistance. If they display the right behaviors, the right characteristics to want to learn and grow into the role, we'll give them the training. We need the right attitude and mindset, right? So in doing so, we make sure we test them on a level playing field, right? We don't care where you come from, right? We don't care what you've done for a job. You haven't have to come from banking or counted cash. As long as you come in and show us that you've got these skill sets, we'll test you on a red, amber, green status of a pass rate. Anyone that's amber will still progress with the view of right. They're not quite fully green. We like them. We see development here. As part of the induction program, make sure, of course, that you focus on these areas where they didn't perform so well on. So in essence, what you're doing there is you're giving people one a chance to basically apply for roles that they think they wouldn't be qualified for in the first place. What that does indirectly is creates loyalty because they're thinking, right, well, no one else would touch me because they because I worked as a fisherman. But they've given me a chance, and that actually extends the long term loyalty, which of course another sort of topic is like quality of hire metrics. So then by gaining long term stability and loyalty from your, your workforce, you then cut down recruitment costs, it improves time to hire, it increases your diversity pool, because then you can sit there and say in a year's time, we've now basically increased hiring, it's taken two weeks less, but also we've hired these people, these demographics, these professions. Um, if done correctly, it's a massive employer branding and recruit marketing tool for you as well. Yeah, definitely. So what you are basically saying is when moving to skills-based hiring, instead of looking for the, the, the usual requirements that you have X amount of years of work experience, education, etc., look for the, the uh, yeah, let's call it soft skills and hard skills uh, mm -hmm. that you need in order to be successful in the role. Maybe soft skills might sometimes be even more important than hard skills if you can train for those hard skills. Depends a little bit on the role, of course. Um, and hire people based on that. How would you, before we dive into, uh, because we are going to touch upon what kind of tools, for example, would you need in order to uh, in order to implement uh, a talent pooling strategy where you base that on skills. But before we move on to that, uh, or maybe ties in with the tooling a little bit, um, because one of the most important pillars, I think, nowadays in most hiring processes is also how can we make sure it's objective and fair and really provide everyone with an equal opportunity from the get-go how does that come into play in in uh, skills-based talent pooling to make it fair you can do a number of things right you can even do blind cvs so a lot of companies out there have an ats software where they will basically remove the name of the person um some companies will then rebrand them the name of like blue monkey red lion yellow ostrich so basically it removes any bias towards the person's name it removes qualifications and, and schools that's a way of making it fair. The skills-based hiring itself there, once again, makes it fair because you can do away with asking for a CV. So you can go down the route to basically not knowing about the person's background and read all of that from the hiring process. 
or you can say right submit your details as long as you're in the right location right and the right right to work is there we'll test you based on the skills that we set out in our assessment so like you guys do there your, your, your games based assessment you make sure of course that you create the platform the format that's fair for everyone of course take into account things like reasonable adjustments for those that are neurodivergent those that require you know additional time if they you know, have problems obviously with sound sites it's being accommodating to everyone. So not just about the actual assessment, but also how you test them, how you engage with them. It goes deeper than just basically saying, by the way, it's now skills-based. You have to make sure, of course, that you look and you pull about the layers and go, right, so is it fair for everyone? How is it fair for everyone? How do we let them know and engage them to make sure that we make it fair for them? So before they go to the process, asking them, do you have reasonable adjustments? If so, how can we accommodate? I think... You have to make it inclusive, not from the assessment piece, but make it inclusive, of course, for every person that's applying um, and their background, disabilities and adjustments needed. No, no, fully agree. And uh, and by shifting it from from experience to potential, there's uh, there's it's already much more objective and inclusive, of course. Hey, a, a, um, a, a crucial pillar in this whole story. Um, and I, because it's something that I see that uh, our customers also tend to struggle with quite a bit is this whole strategy around talent pooling, where you basically, let's say, label uh, your external candidates and internal team members on their soft skills, hard skills, and then map them to different roles within the organization. Um, the success of that all depends on the extent to which you're actually sure of what you're looking for for a specific role so what are those i think the hard skills might be a little bit more easier to uh to figure out but i think especially when it comes to the soft skills part like what kind of cognitive abilities behavioral characteristics whatever should you be looking for if you don't have that right then talent pooling obviously is also not going to work so how would you advise organizations to go about that? How to figure out what kind of competencies actually determine success in a position? You have to define as well. Look, skills-based hiring would never become a blanket introduction across the whole entire company, right? We did it on retail hiring because we could monitor the results of it because it was volume hiring. So we were hiring a number of people in the same profession, different locations, but same salary. So to implement skills-based hiring across the whole entire company in one go, it's not feasible. And again, equally like to your point earlier as well there, certain roles will require hard skills as part of the assessment, right? Some will require soft skills because again, it's very early careers. So for example, if you're looking at graduate hiring, early careers hiring, you could argue that a lot of the people there that come up with degrees, yes, they have some worth granted, but if you're looking to hire graduates and you don't set a parameter, they must have a degree in business management, you're basically hiring people that have a degree that probably also spent some time working in leisure, retail, Hospitality, how do you differentiate them? Well, you put them through a skills-based or testing environment or a game investment assessment environment to determine the skills that they possess because in essence, they're all graduates. They've all probably had some kind of form of work in, in that environment. So then how do you make it fair? You remove the degrees, you remove the, the career history and you test them on what's there and then. The problem you've then got is yes, into roles like qualified accountants, legal counsel, you are going to need to put in place some form of hard skills or qualifications because you know, you wouldn't hire someone to go into an operation on you and do a heart bypass if they played as a kid operation or if they used to have a doll they used to dissect. So, of course, you're going to need certain degrees, qualifications for more senior roles and more, I guess, specific roles that require those skills, right? But I'd say look at a business area first that you can perhaps test it on. And then, you know, like Genesis of AI, don't rush it. Like, you need to get it right, but also you need to test it in the right area look at the ROI on it, look at what you want out of it and determine as well, if you are going to use it, what does good look like? Because a skills-based hiring model has different means, different people. Some want to go and determine how it's going to improve to hire. Some want quality of hire. Some want basically better attrition rates. Some want a better quality of candidate, right? So it's defining what to you skills-based hiring means and also what the outcome of it is. That's what I'd say. Then I've got your point there that it's not for everyone or every role. But I think the more and more companies that let's take an example, right? They always want X amount of years experience, right? I think we can all agree here that tenure does not guarantee experience. Agreed? Yeah. But but no one's challenging that because it's just again it's the norm. Again, like senior roles must have a degree. Well, I'm sorry, but for the last ten years you earned your craft in a corporate environment. So surely that ten years of experience now outweighs the degree that you hold so precious. So let's face it, like 
the sourcing selection still is very, very legacy based. The skills based hiring to a certain extent levels the playing field for all candidates. But yeah, to answer the question, there's no silver bullet for every company because every company's got different strategies and hiring needs. Yeah. Hey, and um, before we dive into the, 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 like, what kind of practicalities do you need to get started? Um, and I'm also, by the way, going to touch upon the question step after that, because I do see a couple of questions coming in. Um, but this is, it's, um, so I think organizations do understand the urgency of talent pooling. Uh, and uh, both from a talent shortage point of view, but definitely also from an inclusive hiring point of view. However, that doesn't mean that, uh, the hiring managers fully support that approach or are fully, very comfortable making that transition. I mean, we are literally using CV since the 1950s. We've always based our evaluation upon work experience, education, etc. So it's a huge shift for people to make. How did you, um, how did you manage to convince hiring managers to join this transition? I always said hard skills, open doors, soft skills, close offers because the CV, let's face it, with ChatGPT now and AI, you can basically format your CV to make you sound awesome. And the common trend that I get from managers when getting feedback is the CV was great, the person wasn't. So CVs do a really, really good job around telling someone you're good at what you do, but often not, it's almost like you elevate your experience and skill sets, right? So then you get to interview, they're expecting this dream candidate that then has done all of this, but they meet with them and go, well, they've not quite hit the mark there. It happens across, and I've seen it across tech, development, product, finance, legal. So the CV has been going along since Da Vinci started it and think 1572. That's how long it's been going for, right? And no one's found anything to kind of replace it. But my argument to that would be that managers like the CV, but it's because that's all they've ever known. Equally as well, if anything you want to put into your business, you have to come ready with more just a feeling and the motion. You have to bring data points. You have to bring intel to back up your rationale. Doing it, obviously, where I am now, where I'm now I had to, it wasn't just a case of, right, I've got a gut feeling this happens. I went to LinkedIn Talent Connect in New York. They said this year, skills-based hiring is going to be a big thing, and so is generative AI. Did my research. I was like, right, I've done my research. I know this works in this place here, and then I know that it will basically improve X, Y, and Z. So as talent partners, be consultative to your hiring managers understand their pain points and also you know make make a note of obviously the feedback on cvs you've had for this world 20 cvs you've had 10 interviews seven of those 10 so far haven't hit the mark well either the advert's wrong your criteria is wrong because the cvs that are coming and you say great so i think it opens up the candidate pools there so i agree that you have to have a promise of hard skills so let's make it up you have to obviously you know be a qualified accountant to basically be you know, or qualified by experience they're obviously non-negotiables but rather than say must have 10 years, what are the soft skills? Can they literally be a communicator? Because often in certain roles, I think anyone must call as well as this now, just to find two when you get a hiring brief for a hiring manager and you say, what do you need? Often not, it's things like must be a team player, must communicate really well, must be adaptable. They always list off what seems to be the soft skills. Maybe that's because they assume that we know the hard skills, but let's face it, sometimes the hard skills don't correlate to what's in the CV. And then yeah. often people buy people. So then you hire the person that's made that best impression on you, often from their soft skills. Yeah, I fully agree. And uh, I liked what you said, like hard skills. Uh, well, I was not the only one who liked it. I see it in the, the chat, like hard skills, open door, soft skills, close offer. I always say uh, hard skills might be the reason for people to get in, but it's almost always soft skills that are a reason to leave. Like if you, usually if you ask a hiring manager, hey, why did someone turned out to be unsuccessful. Hiring managers probably wouldn't say there's insufficient experience compared to what's on their CV, but hey, the, the people didn't pick it up fast enough. They, they didn't work well with the team. They made a lot of mistakes in their work or whatever. It's, it's usually related to skills and other yeah. experience. So yeah, I fully agree. Um, hey, before we continue to... Um, some practical tips and tools on how you can get started. I would like to touch upon a couple of questions from the audience to make sure I don't forget about it. Uh, to start with Stephanie, she's on top. Um, many hiring teams only want people with the same experiences as the role they're hiring for. Uh, training people up or uh, taking 
uh, transferable skills into account doesn't look like a viable option due to a fear of risk. How can these concerns be addressed and turned around? And I maybe to add to that, uh, it's this is something that I also experience quite a lot with our um, with our customers that if we want to make that transition to hire more for soft skills and train for the hard skills that uh, usually there's a lot of objections from within the business like oh we don't have time to actually train people they need to be up and running asap so i think it ties in a little bit to what stephanie's asking uh what what is your view on that dominic um fair assessment and fair observation there right and i think that's again where look i think the role of a team partner has changed right we're not just basically putting them on the seat have to challenge educate not just our stakeholders but also management c-suite board level you want us to bring in the best talent available to you, right? You almost want polished talent there and then, right? But polished talent is also very volatile. They know the polished talent. If you can't engage with them or develop them, they will leave. So to that argument, I always probably say as well that if you bring in ready now talent and you still don't have any kind of framework in place there to basically upskill them, reward them, promote them, engage with them, they'll leave anyway. So plus you've got the risk of a higher salary, higher cost per higher ratio to it. With regards to you know the point you made, Stephanie, I completely get it. It's the whole mindset of managers. The problem is as well is often a fear of they have no support and they're often against the cosh and they want someone to come in, take the ground running because they're literally maxed out. Now you can argue that as a business issue, but also as well as, as a as a workforce issue, as a headcount planning issue, right? I think if you offer managers the chance to really have time to come in with someone and actually work with them to evaluate their skill sets and actually help them grow, they will get a lot more better return on investment there. And the, the chance of them rehiring that role in six months' time is pretty slim. The problem is that often they want the here and the now and the ready made. It comes at a cost. It's often wanted, you know, by a lot of people. So you you basically ask the same candidate everyone wants. It comes at a cost. If you're not paying the best market rates, often the best salaries, you'll then be sat there having to rehire that same role over and over again. Or you can't hire it, right? So I think it's a case of I hear you, and you're not wrong, right? But I think the business needs to understand the value of skills based hiring, but also the value of hiring, not just for the role now and the problem space now, but how that role will grow out in the next 12 to 18 months. And if that person gets the training, development and support from not just the hiring manager, but the business, if you've got an internal talent management team itself there, you'll get a lot more buying from the new, new hire. Longevity, referrals, it looks good as an employee branding piece as well, right? So I think it's we have to start pushing back. And you can do that where it's not aggressive, it's not argumentative. In consultative, look, you come to me to solve problem space here. Right? I'm here to solve it. I'm giving you data and stats here. If we operate the same we have done now, we we'll always get the same results we've always got. We need to look at ways of literally looking at hiring now, but for the future, and not focus on the urgency right now. Yeah, I fully agree. I always give the example, uh, like imagine that uh, we, for example, use LinkedIn advertising a lot for our business. So our marketing team needs to understand LinkedIn advertising. So I'm, I always give the example, like imagine that LinkedIn would not exist and would start with LinkedIn advertising tomorrow. That means that if you would like to switch to LinkedIn advertising, then your marketeers don't know the program. You also wouldn't fire your current workforce because they don't master a hard skill that you are looking for. So why would you then reject a very good potential candidate because they only don't master that one specific hard skill. It's, but it's uh, I, Stephanie, I do get uh, I do get your point. I think it's uh, like Dominic said, you have to keep keep having that discussion. I think just every now and then with the business as well. Um, I see another question. I'm not sure whether I understand it, but maybe Dominic, you do, and if not, then we can ask for some clarification. Do you think that graduate hiring can help making an inclusive talent pool as a foundation um i think yeah graduate hire i think the best ways to implement skills based hiring is around generally volume or ones that are coming into the workforce or career transitions right as we discussed earlier more mid-level roles you require some form of hard skill the beauty of, of doing it with you know graduates is because they've you know all experienced kind of some kind of commitment i'd say as well as well with graduate hiring it's a graduate role a lot of companies now don't require graduates so someone that's obviously left school wants to go into a graduate program so i think that again is 
about living the playing field because again i think like companies like um I think ey have stopped requiring a graduate or a degree to come to the graduate program so i think to i guess not push back but to kind of again look at it slightly differently anything early careers a graduate program doesn't require a degree or kind of set the chance for you as a business to build a framework as to looking at you know what longevity looks like in a company look at your current workforce where do they come from what's their career path like are we having to basically find and hire into the management because nothing's come through from early careers so i think it's all well and good right trying to put into place skills-based hiring mindset but you have to understand the current workforce now their journey where they've come from have we always had to go out to market to get people rather than actually growing internally if so if we are going to put into place skills-based hiring as, as i mentioned earlier look at hiring for the graduate roles now but have in mind as well hiring for the next role for two or three years down the line equally as well if you're looking to hire the graduates the gen workforce who are going to be the most populated volume of workforce by next year they also want to become quite quickly right they don't want to be sat in their role with the millennials and boomers for the next five ten years they want to progress their role every couple of years so your skills based hiring has to have a level playing field that's basically interlaced with some form of progression for them if not what's the purpose yeah. of it yeah yeah and i think uh, maybe uh, to add to that i think it's where a graduate hiring comes in i think very useful in this discussion is i think if we speak about uh mainly skills-based hiring uh, i think that's the higher up in the tree the more scary that gets for organizations so i think that graduate hiring is usually uh, uh, because it's all junior roles, something that feels a little bit more comfortable to start. And we've seen it, uh, we've seen it as well with a couple of uh, customers. Friesland Campina, I think there are quite also some Dutch people in the webinars today, so they will recognize it's a, it's a large uh, Dutch organization. They actually shifted away from using CVs in the selection of uh, graduates and focused on just the, the results of the assessments and interviews instead. And uh, what they've seen is that uh, therefore, the diversity within the group of trainees became much better. Uh, and trainees are usually, of course, the ones that, uh, well, the high potentials that eventually should grow into the organization. So if you could then perceive that group as the, your internal talent pool, uh, it does open a lot of doors, of course, to, uh, to make your workforce a little bit more inclusive. Um, before I'm going to touch upon the last question in the chat, uh, there's one topic that we didn't specifically touch upon, uh, Dominique, so I wanted to do that still. Um, what are, in your opinion, the, the must-have tools you should have in place in order to get started with talent pooling? Because talent pooling is all about keeping track, I think, also of uh, uh, what mm. people can, what people want. So there needs to be at least, I think, a place to store this information. So uh yeah what would you recommend in terms of tooling um so i recently well i used years ago aperture as a as a platform and then there's a lot more out there that are modern i think if you've got an ats now is there a function there to candidate pool if not look at investing some money into a talent pool so the hr function because the biggest common trend that you are seeing now that i've seen ta is lack of investment again it comes back to to find the investment and again the ROI. So if you're going to your stakeholders and saying, right, we have no functionality currently talent for our people, here is you know this platform that we currently use we have available to us that we can use to talent pool. The cost of that talent pool is gonna cost us ten thousand euros per year. Mm -hmm. But and so you know that will save if you go to go to agency, imagine the cost of paying ten thousand pounds to get one software. Anyone on the call here runs obviously in house to hire one hire an agency will probably cost twice that so imagine that that you and i, I guarantee now everyone on this call that's basically had a candidate come into your role and apply for a company if you've got no way of basically retrieving all applications they will probably at some point come into a company in a few years time via an agency that you'll be paying for so look to basically invest in it do your research too as well i know some will obviously bolt onto a hris or an ats some are already part of an ats but i think like anything you put into play there do your research booking calls with companies to understand first of all, what you want out of it right because again it's not just what it can do for you but it's what you want out of it as well um i know some companies will post a role and will then obviously add the skills as part of the role in the ats it will then highlight people in a talent pool i'll try and find them the company to do it but it basically bolts on their ats when they go to post a role externally to, to like linkedin 
and they put the 10 skills there that are required, and these could be soft and hard skills, it doesn't match with the, ta the talent pool and go, what about John Smith? What about Jane Simmons? They've got six out of seven pools. Now, granted, they might be the right fit, but the, the talent pool is already identifying the skills match there straight away. So you can set it based on parameters of around skills. You can do it based on location. You can do it based on job titles they're looking for. You, you can set the practice down to you to understand what's important to you. If you know that you struggle to hire people in the tech development world, start tagging things like tech stacks, like Java, you know, um, React Native. So again, when someone comes back into play again, you want, you know, you know someone. For example, if you are that hell bent on having someone's got five years in development experiences, you might reject a, you know, a Java developer that's got three years. Guess what? Two years time, they've got five years back into talent pool, drag them out again. No, no, fair point. Hey, and then um, my last question for you before we are going to slowly uh, recap everything that we discussed in, the, in today's webinar. Um, how does employer branding, but also effective communication comes into play? Or because it's, it's uh, obviously moving towards talent pooling based on skills-based uh, hiring uh, is a great step forward. But if candidates are not aware of that, then probably there's still a huge risk that they wouldn't even apply for a job in the first place or uh, any other scenario. So uh, do you have any advice in terms of communication and employer branding, how to go about that? Yeah, I think, look, you apply to another role now, right? And you get the same generic email. Thank you for applying to the role. We'll be in touch. We can communicate so much better with our candidates, right? Some of the best companies out there will say to a candidate, thank you for applying. FYI, here's our current timeframes. Here's our process. Here's what's going to happen with your CV. It gets reviewed by us, not by a, um, a robot. Equally as well, if you're not successful for this role, we'll put you into our, our, our talent pool for the next X amount of years, depending on obviously on your location and your um, GDPR policies. But, and when obviously you apply to the job, you consent to that. By telling that we constantly review our, our candidate pools, our talent pools, and we'll reach out to you with, you know, options that were suitable for you. The, it's just the communication and the promise to candidates will basically strengthen employer branding. Could you imagine if you then, for example, someone applied to a job last year, they weren't right for the job, you talent pulled them, you had a role come out a year later, and because you effectively made sure you tagged the right tags on the candidate, you're like, oh, hi, John, yeah, it's me from so-and-so. A year ago, you applied to a job, but we've kept, kept an eye on you. Actually, you know, we've got a role now that's right for you. Would you want to talk about it? And they're like, one, kind of experience, smashing. Engagement piece as well, their employer branding. That will then go a long way. And you see companies now always talk about promotions internally on their, on their socials, right? No one's ever spoke about how a talent pool helped them identify a new hire. And it could be junior hires, senior hires, right? But imagine the press that you get as a company. If you were like, right, John Smith's now joined as head of product. Bizarrely, John applied to us two years ago, but John wasn't you know, successful then. But you know what? We kept an eye on John in our talent pool. We made sure, of course, we kept an eye on his skills. We know when the role came out, we could have gone to market. But you know what? John was always sat there. No one talks about that. And that, you know, um, that is an incredible sort of, I guess, you know, achievement to have there in the way of, we always talk about the cliche things, promotions, hires. No one talks oh. about the strength and the quality of a good candidate pool and talent pool. So um, in doing so, you know, think about the good press behind it. Think about the good value you bring to people, saying to them, we see you now, but also we still see you down the line. You're not going anywhere. You're not being basically just, you know, metaphorically CV's been scrunched up and put in a bin. We've got the CV, we've put it into a little filing cabinet, and we have kept it on file. We think about you all the time. We'll be in touch. Yeah, yeah indeed, you're fully right. You never hear those stories out there. It's uh, it's funny, we did a, a bit of a side story, but we did a research, I think, September last year into a couple of um, enterprise customers who had quite some volume on job applicants. And uh, we sort of categorized their roles on similarity in terms of skills and seniority levels that you would be looking for. Uh, and we found out that if they uh, would have shared candidates with each other for those similar roles with similar skills, they would end up having 34 times more qualified candidates per role uh, than they mm -hmm. now had when just looking at one solo role. But uh, yeah, you never, uh, you don't hear those stories often out there, I think. I, uh, I agree. Cool. 
but also, also as well to add to that point as well sorry to interject there if you've got a candidate pool imagine right that you get a new role that comes out with a hiring manager you always go to the hiring brief and to get more information from them could you imagine if you went to the hiring brief and you pulled out five candidates from your talent pool to go to the hiring brief and right so based on the criteria you've given me before even going to market i bought you five candidates candidate pool that have already applied to us imagine again that the relief from the managers when they say right okay you bought us five two are really good so before we even start going to market we've already got two people that we know want to work for us that applied before that probably would appreciate a phone call back no one's doing that i guarantee you now if you are i apologize but no one's going to hire briefings of managers and putting candidates for tackles easy hiring yeah. right <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Uh, and to be fair, I also never heard it before. Um, hey, we got uh, four minutes left. So uh, maybe to uh, to also quickly wrap up the session, because I always like it when people go out of the of a webinar and think, hey, these are two or three very practical things I can start doing tomorrow already to start working on this concept. So if you uh, would have to give everyone in the audience like one or two tips or things that they could start doing today or tomorrow, uh, to uh, to just get started uh, with this concept, what would those uh, two tips be? Uh, or three, or three if you have yeah. three, that's also fine. Yeah. Yes, do your research, right? People often know what well, companies are an example of that, right? They want something, they think they want something. Do your research, find out the benefit of it. If you feel that it will add value to a company, put it in a business case, but please go in it with, with data and stats and rationale. Is if you're going with a gut feeling or just a, just a hunch, often than not, because it's obviously going to be it's a risk averse, right? And then probably element in the form of cost, the chance of you getting involved are pretty slim. So if anyone has done it before, evaluate all parameters, assess all the risks, build a compelling business case, um, and make sure, of course, that you, you know, put forward your best case, give options to as well as to what you want to do. That way, then, expecting options get one selected, give one option, get no selected. Um, to the point as well, there focus on the basics too, as well around can fall in. Like I mentioned, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the communication piece, the employer branding piece, you'll organically generate a lot more diverse pools of people by just your recruitment marketing. Well, I had a call the other day with somebody, and they were like, "Oh, we can't really hire diverse talent." I was like, I "Looked at your posting on LinkedIn, looked at your career page." You literally have all middle-aged white females. This is why you have problems with diverse hiring. So, certainly, turn it, obviously, your strategy, your marketing class role, that will not just obviously having a you know kind of pool, right? I mean, because look at your current recruitment market strategy right now. How you communicate, how you engage, the impression of the company that you vex people. Um, and then third, look, let's try and use some form of, of like AI research, right? AI. Is it coming? It's here. Most companies want to use it. A few know how they want to use it. So it'll be part of dual space power at some point in the future as well. Also candidate pooling. Um, I like an AI and put an AI into business by bringing home a new dog. If you bring it home and let it loose, it will tear your house apart. It will just cause havoc. If you bring an AI into a company, like a dog into a house, train it, give it restrictions, set boundaries, understand what you want out of it to go and build you know that you know that framework as to how it's going to benefit your business so that's kind of my three points there hopefully they're useful cool thanks dominic i can't uh, see you anymore but i can still hear you i think uh, you might oh. have a little bit of connection issues but i heard all of your uh, i could hear all of your tips so thanks a lot for uh, um for sharing those and uh ah there are people who i can't see you dominic so it's uh, probably on my end uh um, thanks so much for joining today's session. And I think, uh, yeah, 45 minutes is a, is a short amount of time uh, to talk about a concept as complex as this one. So I'm sure for everyone who's listening, uh, definitely a recommendation, by the way, to follow Dominic on LinkedIn. He has a lot of great uh, posts on LinkedIn, but I think, uh, Dominic, you would also be uh, very willing to maybe have a follow-up conversation with the people mm. who are listening today who might still have a question for you um before we wrap up uh as webinars are obviously also a good marketing tool for our platform 
Uh, good to know for people in the audience is that we are going to launch a talent pooling slash talent feature in our um, talent matching feature on the equality platform next week, which means you can see for all the candidates who completed the games exactly what kind of jobs would they also fit in. So if there are any customers in the webinar today or people interested in just finding out, then uh, feel free to go to our website, schedule a call with us. Um, and having that said, Dominique, uh, thanks so much for joining uh, for joining me today. Uh, I learned a lot, and uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it too. I loved it, and uh, you guys are the talent point in the tool as well. That's amazing. So yeah, um, I also recommend to as well the guys over at Equitra as well because they're phenomenal. So yeah, go and check it out. Thanks a lot, Dominic, and uh, thanks everyone for listening in today. And hope to see you soon uh, during one of our next webinars. Have a great day. Ciao. Thanks everyone.